Before we get into today's video, I would like to thank all of my lovely channel members and especially my lovely darling stewards. Bella Mare, Husky HD, Hopeful, Mystic Jade 111, Giovanni Moretti, Twilight Mia, Angry Boxman, Hella, Melofia, Anonymous Weep, and Nicodemus D. Thank you for your support and also a huge thank you for all of my darling mates for your continued support. Now I hope you enjoy the video and please remember to like, comment and subscribe. Thank you. It was relatively late at night when Lucifer's personal butler, Priminger, entered the royal torture chambers. It had been months since it had gotten a good cleaning and Lucifer was very particular about the dungeon's cleanliness. And Priminger was only let into the torture chamber when Lucifer hasn't, verifiably, entered them in ten years. The butler wasn't 100% sure what it entirely meant, however, he was in no position to pry. And ten years on the dot had now passed. As such, it was time for spring cleaning. Using his immeasurable power, the butler began commanding cleaning utensils like servants as they brushed, washed, polished and cleaned. While he carefully inspected each torture device for rust, dents and damages. For instance, Lucifer's bronze bull needed a good rinsing, flushed out the dried up grime out of the Iron Maidens and even sharpened the various tools and blades. Yet, it wasn't until Priminger proceeded into the torture chamber's back rooms when finally something actually shook him. Not to the core, of course. It was more due to a minor inconvenience. On a clothing rack were various leather and latex outfits of Lucifer's ex-wife Lilith. The imp discovered a skin suit. This wouldn't be too out of place in an S&M dungeon, of course, but in hell, skin suits had occasionally terrible implications. In other words, he was obliged on checking the skin's heartbeat. Carefully, Priminger removed the skin suit from the rag and spread it out on a nearby table. Judging by certain aspects of it, it was quite obviously female. Analyzing it, he stared the thing up and down until it twitched very subtly too. The imp sighed, finally placing a hand on his suit's chest. There was no heartbeat, of course, but the imp felt the unmistakable presence of a soul. Sighing deeply, Priminger wrapped the skin suit up before throwing it on his shoulder. Snapping his fingers, he immediately teleported into his master's workshop, where Lucifer was working on his rubber duckies. My lord, said Priminger as he bowed deeply. Ah, Prim! shouted Lucifer joyfully. I was just about to ask for some tea. Lucifer turned around and then crossed his arms. What the me is that? Some souls in hell were condemned to worse fates than others. From the common false imp, which was basically just a person with horns, to monstrosities of sin, large, overweight things with hands for a head, eyes bulging out of their stomach and teeth growing out of their fingertips. But those were rare, a fate reserved for only the most vile of being. Yet some souls were punished harsher for lesser crimes. And those included skin suit demons. As the name implied, they had the appearance of someone's removed skin. And when touched, they felt like cheap latex. But in fact, this 
thing was a living, breathing soul. Skinsu demons often appeared out of nowhere. No fiery entrance to hell for them. They were found in gutters, sewers, and other dark and miserable places. Their only solace was the fact that they were completely unaware of anything happening around them. They had only one ability, though considering the fact that this ability had no upper ceiling, could be very powerful in the wrong hands. If any sentient humanoid being would wear the skin suit demon, be they angelic, demonic, or once human. In the case I wanted to, or was forced to wear one of these living suits, they would awaken out of their dormancy. Once both feet and hands were filled in. Afterwards, the suit would envelop the person wearing them like a warm, soft flesh prison. It would adjust its form to any shape and body size, as long as hands and feet fit, and even accommodate for tails and horns by leaving holes, once fully enveloped. The skin suit would then awaken and take full control over whatever thing wore them. Additionally, any power the wearer possessed would be subsumed by them, as long as the skin suit was worn. But why would someone willingly be consumed by such a being? Should the skin suit demon be sedated before being worn, the wearer would keep full motor function. And in this state, any experience the demon had would be shared with the skin suit. And things such as drugs, alcohol and even sex would double, creating a sensory overload and addiction-free state of euphoria. Skin suit demons, when discovered, were usually immediately filled with regular garden worms. As through years of trial and error, as that was seemingly the only a functional alternative to actually being worn by another being. The worms would take on the role of muscles and even condense at the center of limbs to form rudimentary bones. And the skin suit demon Priminger just discovered was in fact you. You went by the name of Poppy, and his loose skin suit had in fact been purchased by Lilith, and then promptly forgotten. Since Lilith was gone already for seven years, plus the three extra years until Primager was allowed to clean the torture chamber, there was no real point of measurement aside from those ten years. Since you weren't filled with worms, you were in a permanent dormant state and would not know yourself. Heck, you could have probably been on sale for at least a hundred years. After Lucifer ordered Prim to fill you up with worms, so a conversation was possible, you were quickly informed that not only did at least 10 years pass since you were purchased, but also that there was no real use for you here. Thankfully though, Lucifer's daughter owned a little hotel, which you would be a perfect fit for, pun definitely intended. Living in the hotel was actually quite easy. You fit very well into the quirky group of misfit demons. But one thing was pushing you forward. You wanted to go to heaven, so you no longer needed to be filled with worms. Sure, you didn't feel them, you didn't even see them, but you knew. It was the thought that just beneath your skin they were wiggling. You were disgusted by your own continued existence. Tonight, you were sitting at the hotel's bar. You seldom went to sleep in your bed. Whenever you tried sleeping like a normal person, your mind automatically wandered to thoughts of loose dirt and moist earth. 
As if the wiggling things inside you were taking hold of your mind in your sleeping state. Though, aside from dreams of your covered in mud, they lack the power to actually co take control of your body. It was a horrifying existence, but it was your life. Here, yeah, Wormback, gruffed Husk, the barman. He was trying to give you a drink that would buzz you up to the point of sleep. A ritual the two of you had started a week ago. Thank you. To keep your body functioning, you needed a lot of liquid to keep the worms hydrated. They ate what you ate, so there wasn't any issue with that. An almost constant supply of water, soda or booze, however, was needed to be on hand at all times for you. Husk smirked as you downed the drink immediately. Always nice to meet a fellow heavyweight. You smiled. I mean, I'm not the only one drinking. You look at your hand with a melancholic expression. Hey, what did I say? No wormy thoughts while at the bar. He placed his hand on yours, making you faintly blush. He applied a little pressure until your hand bummed on the polished wood. You looked at him. Thanks. He looked away. Whatever. After that, you ordered a few more drinks. Husk needed to be a little tipsy before he brought out his cocktail shaker, which was your main goal. He just needed to get bored of the generic alcohol taste first, but that was okay. By the way, Wormback. You told your dad curiously. You ever told me how you got into the King of Hell's basement of all places in the first place? You opened your mouth to say your regular answer of I don't know. How could you? You were sold in your dormant state. I don't mean that crap. I mean, how did you get into the position of being sold in the first place? You blushed hard and tapped your fingers together. The bodysuit trade was quite common and matter of fact. Uh, bodysuit contacts are sold a dime a dozen. Our souls are worth nothing. Or in other words, not worth the upkeep. Uh, we usually get sold to druggies who are chasing a bigger high, or nobles who want to experience something new. Still don't answer the question. I'm getting there. You said irritated. I wanted to be worn, okay? The easiest way to do that is to sell yourself. I don't have the confidence to convince someone to wear me. Nor do I have anything to offer to anyone. Why well, do you want to be worn? It feels good. It feels good to feel the resistance of a real body. To have actual joints, actual muscles. Feeling the weight of bones. It's this constant feeling of something not being right with my body. It's too light, too squirmy, too squishy. I feel like I'm not myself unless I'm wrapped around someone. Husk stared into your hazel-colored eyes as you explained. Something about the description was not only incredibly sad, but also somehow kinda hot. In a twisted way, of course. Ugh, maybe I was just getting drunk. I see. So you sold yourself to someone... So someone wears you? Pretty much. That's why all my kind do it. Husk was quiet for a moment. And then pulled out the cocktail shaker. Let's get your shit face then, huh, puppy? The shaker was shaken dozens of times that night. 
fruity drinks, strong drinks, knockout drinks. Didn't matter. It was just fun being with someone. Someone who seemed to understand you. With a pleased smile, you were sitting at the bar. One hand pressed against your forehead, while the other held the glass, which he was refilling. Yo, oh, have a woman who can knock him back like that. Oh, you already said that. You mused. Your head was spinning. If you had a heartbeat, it would be beating without rhythm. It would be beating fast, though. There was so much alcohol in your system. But as your thoughts turned to your lack of heartbeat, your face turned into a frown. Man, a heartbeat. You missed that, too. It was then you felt one of Husk's claws poke your chin. With only the lightest of pulls, he forced you to look at him. Uh, what's up? You mumbled. But before you could react, the cat demon pressed his furry lips onto yours. Surprised, your eyes widened. Due to his nature, his lips were rather thin, and they just barely covered his sharp canines. But still, he felt soft, and the fur around his mouth tasted like delicious cocktail concoctions that never existed. It was tasty, as it was sinful. And Husk himself was surprised, too. He didn't really expect you to have a conventional tongue, or, well, mouth, but it seemed that your skin suit included a fully functional jaw, Though, uh, he didn't dare to plunge his tongue deeper than just the tip. If he tasted those worms, he'd throw up immediately. But it were the worms that made your tongue incredibly agile as well, allowing it to stretch and wiggle in ways no one else could. It was an incredible experience. But all good things come to an end, as he slowly pulled out. A long string of salvia connecting your mouths. His hands were cupping your face. He smirked proudly at himself and looked at you. Didn't I tell you not to think of them worms, Poppy? I. Uh, I. I you, you did. You mumbled. You had gotten lost in his eyes. If you want, we can keep going, as long as you don't think about them. You blinked once, twice, thrice. If we do this, isn't this gonna change everything? Ah, oh, fuck it. Literally. And that was all the convincing that you needed.